Hey everybody, this is John with another installment of Think Culture, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about this video, or <laughs> this book, uh, Christophe Guillaume's Twilight of the Elites, Prosperity, the Periphery, and the Future of France. It's explicitly about France, however, he connects um, to the West generally, analytically, uh, here and elsewhere, and he, what he's describing are essentially products of the process of neoliberal globalization. He is documenting its effects, um, its, its social effects in terms of social stratification, in terms of the geographic distribution of populations. And so this is a pretty data heavy book. Um, he refer, he, I mean, there's a lot of statistics and things like that in it. And this has become a genre, I'm using this as a stand in for this genre. Um, uh, of, of you know, social science and history, I've become more interested in sort of particulars recently. Throughout most of my life, I've been, I've mostly just read philosophy. But within the last few years, I've seen increasingly the importance of, of acquiring particulars, of, of, of nuggets of information, of data, of facts, of statistics, of, um, you know, particular people, historical dates, you know, etc. And so I've been reading more of this type of stuff. Um, one book that's very similar to this in terms both of its topic and um, its being this sort of aggregation of a bunch of different data points um, is uh, Michael Lynn's The New Class War. Um, maybe something like Joel Kotkin's Neo-Feudalism book I would also consider sort of in this genre. Um, that's something I read recently that I'd that I think was good, but it's a little bit different thematically. The, the new class war is essentially about the same process um, as, as this book, but it's told in a slightly different way and it's less um, interested sort of in um, the spatialization of the problem, although that is um, something that Michael Lynn does talk about. Um, but yeah, this is, I wouldn't say this is, you know, if, if someone was going to say, what are the 10 books I should read, you know, your most recommended 10 books, 20 books, 50 books, this probably wouldn't make the list. Um, and no book in this genre would make the list. Um, that's just sort of how it is with me. <laughs> but, um, if you were going to ask me, what's a book I could read that would tell me about this process of globalization and, um, give me a lot of factual information about what's happening to people, um, what's happening in terms of incomes, in terms of the ability to buy homes, in terms of you know deaths of despair, what all, all this sort of statistical stuff. Um, if you wanted to know like the particular details of what's going on at that level, then this might be uh, you know one of the main books that I would recommend. But I am using it in this video kind of as a stand-in for this genre of books, of books that are. Um, you know, that are statistical analyses. He's trying to document, you know, statistically, factually, quantitatively, what the effects of globalization are, how globalization is working, what its effects are, what it's doing to people. Um, and sort of the main metaphor here is this idea of metropolization. And he talks about, he says that metropolization is the domestic corollary of globalization. What does he mean by that? Well, if you think about space, if you think about cities, for example, you can think about a city as a kind of um, stopping point in, in the flow of human populations, right? Kind of like an intersection in traffic, right? Once you're, everyone's just driving around, once you get to an intersection, you get this stop, right? You can kind of think of a city as that in, in terms of population flows. People are moving all around the country, whatever. And then there are these, you know, areas in which travel slows down, people stop, some people stop there forever, etc. right? So if you think about space in terms of flows, in terms of the flows of population, and I think that it's easy to understand this concept. Um, one good example uh, that might make it a little more clear is uh, I have kids, so is the movie Cars, right? Radiator Springs is a, is a good example of how this process of metropolization works kind of at a previous level because you get the, you get the interstate, right? And then suddenly Radiator Springs is, is kind of off the map, right? It's not part of this sort of circuit of flows, 
And so nobody goes there. Their businesses decay. You know, um, they don't get any travelers. There's no excitement. There's nothing. It's just this ghost town, basically. That's because it gets the interstate gets built on top of it. The interstate makes cities that are on the interstate closer, and it makes cities that are off the interstate much further away, right? Um, you get, like planes, for example, they do the same thing. You get an airport, and that creates flows between two different points. So you're getting this kind of meta mapping of the world, right? So with um, so what he's talking about with neoliberal globalization, um, we're getting way more international travel, more international trade, international business, um, uh, barriers between nations sort of go down, travel is much quicker, and so you get these basically global hub cities like Paris, London, New York, and those are sites. In this, like in this kind of meta mapping of the world, right? London, Paris, New York, those are very close together, <laughs> right? They're like uh, living in small a small town in Nebraska or something like that. You're much further away from New York than Paris is, even though geographically you're much closer to New York. You're much further away in terms of flows, in terms of the time that it takes you to get there, even. Right, because there are lots of places in the United States that you got to travel hours to get to an airport. It's a small airport, a regional airport, and then that flies you to, you know, one airport that's maybe not even going, you know, in the same direction of where you want to go. And then you got to wait there for several hours to catch another flight to get, you know, finally going the direction you want on this sort of map of <laughs> airport nodes or whatever. Um, so it can actually take you longer to get somewhere that's way closer, right? Just because these nodes of like London, New York are connected, right? That's you're, you're hopping from one of these major cities to the other when you're doing international travel. And that's increasingly, he thinks, the way that in this era of globalization, um, you know, business works, etc. You know, the, you go on a business trip. You're going from New York to Hong Kong or something like that, right? Um, and so part of this process, he thinks, is that, and he, he doesn't, he documents this, <laughs> right? Um, is that opportunities, financial opportunities, educational op opportunities, cultural opportunities, these all get increasingly concentrated in these metropoles. Um, and, and the metropoles become filled with the kind of population that is cosmopolitan, that travels a lot, um, that isn't necessarily tied to any particular place. They're not really tied to the country. They don't necessarily have any kind of national identification. Um, and so it, it doesn't wind up being very surprising when they think that nationalism is like a dirty word or whatever. But um, so uh, along with this process, as the elites concentrate in these areas, educational opportunities, financial opportunities, all the best wages, right? When they concentrate in these metropoles, then property rates, you know, housing prices and stuff like that go up and the working class gets pushed out. New York is a great example because it's an island. But so the working class, the traditional working class gets pushed out of these places so that you develop he refers to these, um, they're, they're also being kind of like modern citadels, right? If you have a physical barrier that prevents the peasants from getting in or whatever, then that's great. But you can also have a cost barrier, right? The peasants can't, they can't live in New York. They can't, they can't, you know, when I was going to school there, my apartment was, um, what was it? <laughs> I mean, I lived at a few different places, but, um, you know, it's, it's that, like when me and when uh, my wife and I were living there, we lived at one point in a tiny one bedroom apartment. And it's like two thousand dollars a year or something like that. It's crazy. And we weren't even, you know, in Midtown or, or whatever um, in any event. So you get priced out. Right. And so these sort of metaphorical barriers are erected and the elites all live within this. And the traditional working class gets pushed out and. They get pushed out and replaced because they have to have nannies, maids, you know, servants, people to get their groceries, 
um, you know, maybe gardeners, whatever. They uh, door, you know, people to to like security to look at after their after their buildings and things like that. They've got to have this population, right? So as the traditional working class gets pushed out, a new unskilled labor force is imported, and they come to fill up what in France are called the banlieues, and these are you know sort of areas that are surrounding the um, the metropole or that are in one place in the metropole or whatever, in which you just have public housing complexes and this immigrant labor force lives there in poverty or whatever, right? So you increasingly get like the rich, this sort of public housing <laughs> complex where all their maids and nannies live, <laughs> right? And then the traditional working class, the traditional working class of that country, the type of person that populates that country, they get pushed out, right? And first, in this process of globalization, they get pushed out, and you know, then manufacturing is done out there, and you know, farming's done out there, all this kind of stuff. And then increasingly, uh, those jobs get shipped overseas, <laughs> right? Assembly jobs, manufacturing jobs, whatever. They get exported to China. And um, so first, the traditional working class gets pushed out, and then their jobs get exported, <laughs> right? And this, the, the sort of attendant consequences of these jobs being shipped overseas in the Rust Belt or whatever, they're not visible at all to people who live in the metropole. And the media is also totally filled with people in the metropole. The perspective that is presented in the media is the metropolitan perspective, right? Hollywood metropolitan perspective. Everyone working there, making films, writing films, whatever. They're, part of, they're, people, they're the elites from these metropoles. Right, there are these elites, and um, and so he says that there's this cleavage that's developing in Western societies, in which you have on the one hand this metropole, and on the other hand this periphery, and like he documents, for example, um, that in France, the periphery constitutes something like sixty percent of the population. This is the majority. The majority of the country is in this condition where opportunities are drying up, drugs are flooding in. You know, there's no educational opportunities, there's no financial opportunities, wages are stagnant or declining, jobs are gone, all, you know, all these problems, they're absorbed by the periphery. They, whereas the people in the metropole, they get all the spoils of globalization, all of the pr attendant negative consequences of globalization, they get exported to the periphery, basically, they're absorbed by those people. Right, uh, and this is the case sort of with everything that happens politically, gas prices go up, who does it affect more, right? It affects more people in the periphery, <laughs> right, than in the metropole. Um, and yeah, their voices aren't heard. They become invisible in the national conversation. You can think about sort of um, the media as kind of this meta-mapping too, right? And in this meta-mapping, um, you know, these nodes never link up to small town in Nebraska or small town in uh, Missouri or small town in... Kentucky or whatever, right? They, they do not link up to those nodes. And so consequently, um, they're invisible. They become literally invisible, right? Everyone's getting their information from the news media and things like that. And this flyover country in the United States doesn't exist. The periphery doesn't exist in this conversation, right? And so that's why he says that it's so shocking. It's so traumatic when you get the yellow vests, when you get Trump, when you get Brexit. And uh, Christoph Dio is actually seen as kind of, he was always on the left previously, but he says the left-right distinction is collapsing in the face of these new class conflicts that are associated with this era of globalization, in which it's really metropole versus periphery or elites versus um, the people who are actually marginalized in the country. Um, and he, he was... Um, I forget what I was going to say about him, but uh, it's it's clear in the United States. It's really clear, and it shocks people to hear things like seventy two percent of Americans live in their hometown, right? Still live in their hometown. When you hear the majority of Americans n never leave their home state, right? This because the idea is mobility, nomadism, you know, cosmopolitanism. We're all going all over the place all the time. Why are you so stuck in attached to this idea of your like local community, whatever. Um, 
That's because in the periphery, he says, you know, one of the most important anthropological facts of the 21st century, maybe the late 20th century, is this reemergence of sedentism in which people in the periphery are stuck there, right? They're, they're trapped <laughs> in some sense. Um, and whereas, you know, travel and existence spatially is fluidized in the metropole, right? You're, you might as well be in Stockholm or, <laughs> or New York or, or Mumbai or whatever, right? You're all, it's all just the same thing. It's just, it's just one sort of global conglomeration. Um, it's like a global city with different areas in it, right? You might, you might as well think of it that way. Um, when I was in grad school in New York, for example, everyone I met was from one of these major metropolitan places. I was the only person that I knew that that wasn't. I was much more rare there. I think actually Glenn Lowry at one point said that um, the rarest person at an elite university is a white male from Christian, rural, conservative America, right? From flyover country or whatever. He said, that's the rarest type of person that you would see there. So if you were really interested in helping, <laughs> you know, a population that is wildly underrepresented at elite universities, then that would probably be the person <laughs> that you would most want to help. Um, of course, they don't. But that was my experience, too. Everyone that I met was from... And they have much more in common, right? Someone from Mumbai um, going to New York, I think they experience less culture shock in some, in some important senses than somebody like me when I'm going to New York, which was the first big city I had ever been to in any capacity. Um, um, yeah, and then you know, people are also shocked when they learn the top 10 congressional districts by wealth in this country are now blue in the Trump era, right? Because they conceptualize the left, the Democrats, whatever, as this kind of, um, you know, party of helping the little guy, labor, or whatever. Whereas in reality, they're the party of the metropole. Basically, you could think about it like that. Um, and then they try to rub in our faces sometimes, like, look at this map of GDP, right? Eighty percent of the GDP in this country is generated by you know, these blue areas on the coast or whatever. And it's like, yeah, that is the problem that we're talking about. That's the problem that Christophe Guillaume is, is documenting. Financial opportunities have disappeared from normal America, <laughs> from your average American, from, from his access. Um, there's that. And then you could look at this. Um, I saw once a visualization of prof professions by party affiliation in the Trump era and um, there was represented by these bubbles and stuff like that and what you find looking at it is that this kind of technocratic managerial elite you know uh, occupations like that they're all blue you know like doctors lawyers engineers you know academics people in media people in finance whatever they're all democrat now and you know um Drivers, truckers, farmers, electricians, whatever, they're all on the other side in this Trump camp. Um, and again, that's the traditional working class, which has been ejected and is um, living uh, without any of these opportunities, which is increasingly impoverished, which is beset by drug problems, suicide, deaths of despair, right? That's all Team Trump. <laughs> Right? Because he represents, in some sense, even though he's from New York, the, this kind of peripheral anger that's saying, you know, we have become invisible, our interests are invisible, we're anti-globalization, we're sick of your moralizing attitude about it, of, of this sort of ideological rhetoric which says, like, no, you guys are backwards, you're bigoted, you're for closed societies, we're for open societies, we're for inclusion, we're for diversity, and, and blah, 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 right? <laughs> that's all ideological mystification that's concealing the fact that in the process of globalization, the elites benefit, and the, pe you know, and, and pe the, the peripheral people, <laughs> you know, they suffer from it. They're people in the metropole, they don't live next to these public housing complexes or anything like that. They're increasingly segregated, 
right? There's a self-segregation that occurs. He calls it a social ghettoization. Um, and so they all just live together. They only interact with each other. They only see each other. Um, so it's very easy in that situation to be like, oh, yeah, my, you know, I like my nanny, whatever. Of course, we love immigrants. We love people, you know, Mexicans or whatever. Uh, there's no problem at all. Of course, we get along with them. You're a racist if you don't, right? You, you people out in the periphery are racist. Whereas the people who are in the periphery, they live next to all these immigrants. They work with these immigrants. They interact with them constantly. You know, they're getting a driver's license and the person giving it to them barely speaks English. They, have, they encounter that problem, right? They don't necessarily live next to people whose norms they share anymore. Social trust, social cohesion, these are declining, right? Because these communities are being um, devastated by the inclusion of parts that don't belong in some sense, right? Um, by the introduction of, of serious cultural differences, right? Uh, you no longer, like, where I, I don't want to dox myself, but, <laughs> you know, um, you can live places, people from foreign countries that, like, have different norms with driving, right? You have people that, you know, um, they have a different conception of the hours of the day and what you're supposed to be doing there. They have different conceptions about masculinity, about rudeness, about whatever, right? Um, and it's the people in the periphery who are stuck in this confused kind of situation and trying to navigate all of this and trying to maintain some shred of the social capital that they used to have, um, which is so essential to them. They're, but, you know, it's going away. Cultural capital's gone. Financial capital's gone. They're losing their social capital, right? And they're... Um, they're mad, <laughs> you know? And so he thinks that we're entering an age of like a kind of modern slave revolt where this periphery revolts against the, against the metropole and that they, um, that they fear that, that they increasingly understand with things like Trump that, you know, there's this different world out there, this basket of deplorables, <laughs> and um, they no longer believe in us. They no longer trust us. They no longer like us. They don't, believe in our institutions they don't believe in our democratic process they've totally lost faith in the technocratic managerial elite that has been established as like um the the people who guide our institutions and sort of caretake our society in some sense um throughout the course of like the 20th century um there it's done that that whole period in, in history of history in the west is is over we no longer have faith in the elites. The periphery is, is rejecting them, is, is saying, you know, we have to have a voice. We have to participate. You can't take, like in the France example, you can't take 60% of the population and say, these are the policies. You're going to abide by them. And if you complain about it, you're a racist, you're a sexist, you're a bigot, you're a closed-minded, closed society, backwards, reactionary, fascist. <laughs> you know, POS, right? Uh, that's not going to work anymore for the periphery. They, uh, they're waking up to the fact that that's ideological mystification, right? That that rhetoric by the, what he calls the bozo, bobos, the bourgeois bohemians, right? Um, that kind of rhetoric is, is no longer going to work, right? Um, yeah, it's, e it's easy to call somebody else racist when... You have totally self ghettoized. You live in your little, your little citadel, right? Um, own, with people who are all exactly like you, these sort of liberal, cosmopolitan, open minded, rich white people, basically, <laughs> right? Um, and that's that's where you are. That's what your life is like. You know, that's where Nancy Pelosi lives, or whatever. Um, AOC is probably a pretty good example of what he calls this bourgeois bohemian. This sort of hipster class who are, um, you know, who are sort of the main uh, responsible for like the rhetorical output of this belief in diversity, equity, and inclusion and stuff like that. The, the they're people the people with cultural capital basically people in the media people in the arts, um, and yeah, they're disgusting. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding>. um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Let me see what else I wanted to say. I want to say anything real quick. Uh, do, 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 do. 
but yeah, that's that's sort of the main contours of this book, and it's it's a you know he's aggregated a lot of facts, a lot of statistical information in order to make this point, right? Um, to make the point about what exactly is missing in the periphery, who's there, how much of the population is there, um, you know, what kind of opportunities exist for them. Uh, like I said, you know, you look at these elite universities, nobody from the periphery is there, right? They're located in or around these metropoles. The people who attend them are from these metropoles, the best schools in the country, primary schools, secondary schools, those are in and around these metropoles. Um, you know, you, you can complain, like he says in France, most of the discourse, if there is discourse about helping the lower class, whatever, it's always directed at these banlieues, at this immigrant population. It's like, poor them, you know, this sort of Muslim immigrant population, mostly in France. Poor them, they need help, they're left out, etc. Right? They're, they're the source of, of uh, focus. And it's similar in the United States, right? The people who are... Um, and so there's a, there's an effort to like get more of them in schools and things like that, but actually they're overrepresented compared with people in the periphery with your traditional working class French people, your traditional working class Americans. Um, and yeah, they don't, they're just not part of that conversation. They've been left out. Um, I guess I'll call it, call it there. This should be pretty good. Um, and he says, yeah, the, the revolution is coming. The existing order will finally break down, not as the result of some decisive event, but as the result of a slow process of social and cultural disaffiliation of the working class. And that's what brought us Trump, and that's what brought us Brexit, and that's what brought us the Yellow Vests. And that kind of thing is going to increase because um, there's, there, 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 you know, we've, we have this new kind of major class conflict that the media and the public discourse has done a lot to hide or to render invisible, but the contours of which are becoming more visible. And the people who are in this, you know, uh, position of mar of actual marginalization are waking up to that fact and, um, uh, and they're fighting, right? And so he says these things are harbingers of the radicalization of rural areas and small towns, which I found... Also interesting because I've been reading about um, about uh, sort of previous decadent societies and things like that, uh, history stuff, and th this seems to be a trend. Like when uh, when the Roman Empire is destroyed, it's uh, aided in large part by a kind of rural disaffiliation. Right, the sort of major cities become increasingly important uh, the way that taxes are levied etc right there's this disaffiliation of people out on the margins out on the periphery of the roman empire they're forgot about they don't feel like their interests are taken into account etc and then they you know become these sort of wandering brigands that even help the invaders <laughs> right because they're they're tired of it then you read about like france prior to the french revolution right same sort of thing. You get these people on sort of the periphery who are out in the rural areas and things like that. They're increasingly marginalized. They're, <laughs> they're, they're the ones being taxed very heavily. All these taxes are being levied against them that they, you know, I've never even heard of. And that are, you know, some of which are even like retroactive. Like all of a sudden you, you've got to pay taxes for the last 10 years of wedding gifts of aristocrats to each other from these metropoles. <laughs> Something like the metropoles. Um, but this seems to be the historical trend is that revolutions, um, the, you know, the total breakdowns of society, their total destruction has to do primarily, it seems to me, with the situation of, of the rural, of people outside of the major cities, what's going on with them. Because even the poor within the cities, right, the Roman Empire notices and takes account of them. Right. Whereas people out in the country, all this stuff happening to them, they're not noticed. They're, they're not paid attention to. Right. Their interests go. They're just, you know, washed away. <laughs> even even in that period today, it's even worse because all of the information that we interact with is digitally mediated. Right. 
there's uh, algorithms are cultivating <laughs> sort of a particular vision of the world for us. And, um, you know, it's coming from all of these elites. And so he's saying, we are, we're entering an era of the twilight of the elites. We no longer trust them. We no longer believe them. We know what they're up to. We know that globalization enriches them and it, impoverish, it, it impoverishes us. And we're no longer going to accept this rhetoric of, um, if you don't like globalization, then you're an evil racist bigot, <laughs> right? Uh, we understand that that's ideological, right? That it's a nice sort of fairy tale that they've, <laughs> a fairy tale kind of narrative that they've created and that they try to have be the sort of basis for all public discourse. And it's BS. It's a, it's a destructive myth that serves to perpetuate their supremacy and <laughs> you know our marginalization and we're not going to take it anymore that's <laughs> that's what this book is about um so i hope that was somewhat interesting or enjoyable to you educational um remember don't simply react but think culture <laughs>